tell us a little bit about how you got interested in history and, uh, and a summary of your uh, career in the National Park Service. Um, I think I was born with an interest in history. I uh, just, I always had it. I think my parents certainly encouraged it. I remember them taking me to Bull Run and to Fort Ticonderoga and to Gettysburg and other places. So uh, that really kindled the interest. I always had a fascination with the Civil War. I grew up during the uh, centennial. So um, the Civil War was all around me. When I went to University of Wyoming, uh, E.B. Long, a lot of people don't know even know who he is today, but he was the research editor for Bruce Catton on his um, his uh, trilogy on the American Civil War, The Coming Fury, Terrible Swift Sword, Never Call Retreat. And um, I mean, Ed Barr's, his knowledge of the Civil War was unbelievable. Uh, but I have to say that um, E.B. Long's knowledge of the Civil War, both military, political, social, was, I'd never met anybody like him. Uh, and he was a wonderful guy. So I, um, I was not a history major when I was at University of Wyoming. It was very stupid uh, that I didn't do that. But um, I then decided that what I really did want to do was work in history and work for the National Park Service. So uh, I was lucky in 1979, I got hired as a seasonal park ranger at Gettysburg. The, that year, Mamie Eisenhower passed away and they opened the Eisenhower Historic Site up the next year in 1980. I got hired as a park ranger, a permanent park ranger at Eisenhower. Worked there for a year and then a uh, job opened at Gettysburg and I transferred back to Gettysburg and spent my entire career at Gettysburg. And uh, that, that's not terribly unusual in the park service today. It was more unusual when I was in, but as I told people, I said, I literally had several different careers when I was at Gettysburg because my job was so varied and different that each period was like an epoch and every, each period was like a completely different job. So um, I worked there through the 150th anniversary in 2013. And then at the beginning of 2014, I retired. And uh, as I've told people, I, I, I had this one fellow who would... Uh, Every time he'd see me at the Y, the YWCA in Gettysburg, he'd always come over to me and he, 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 with a very worried look on his face, he'd say, Scott, are you doing okay? Are you okay? As if, you know, I just retired a week ago. And uh, I would always tell him, I said, um, you know, I was like the guy that I loved my job. I loved everything about my job. But when I left my job, I turned the light switch off and I was good. I did the things I wanted to do. I walked out. I'm, I'm completely fine. Don't worry about me anymore. So I've not looked back. I've really uh, enjoyed being retired. It's given me the opportunity to really devote a lot more time to working on my book. That's great. Speaking of your book, uh, I read your, uh, your book to Antietam that Johns Hopkins Press did. And uh, uh, it, I, I, Ed used to use the term tour de force and, uh, I was just slayed by the, the mastery of the subject and the manner in which you presented it. I understand uh, that the concluding volume is, is due out in the next year or so, uh, and that I think maybe you finished writing it. Uh, uh, what, what, what sparked your interest in the Maryland campaign, and um, uh, what are the two most important things you learned about the campaign uh, that people don't widely know? Yeah, I'd say... Um... Well, I'm currently writing my last chapter, which uh, deals with um, emancipation and then the recovery of the two armies, which I'm very interested in because the, the Army of Northern Virginia was um, in really, really rough shape at the end of that campaign. They, they suffered just devastating casualties, and they also had a massive problem with straggling in the Army. And I was very curious to see how Robert E. Lee was able to rebuild his army. And I also wanted to look at the question of the Army of the Potomac and whether um, they were justified in McClellan not moving the army in the good fall weather that he had or whether he wasn't justified. So I want to give him a fair shake on that. So I'm wrapping up that final chapter. And then there's going to be a lot of work left to do. You have to edit all your chapters you've done. I uh, have to do any appendices I want to do. So there's still plenty of work to be uh, to be finished on that on that project, but hopefully 
it may get published next year if I get everything done on time, like I'm trying to do, but I'm working hard at that. How did I get interested in the Maryland campaign? I, I think I got interested in it because uh, at the time I first embarked upon this, there really literally was uh, two books on the three. You had um, Francis Palfrey, who was in the battle, and he wrote a book in the late uh, 1880s, The Antietam and Fredericksburg. It was a pretty good book. He was badly wounded in the West Woods. Then you had um, uh, Stackpole's book uh, from Cedar Mountain to Antietam, which was not a great book, but it was one of the only things out there that many people could read. And then you had Jim Murphy's book, A Gleam of Bayonets. So yeah. when I got interested in it, Stephen Sears hadn't published his uh, um, his book on Antietam. So, um, I, you know, I've been at this for a really long time. In fact, it was kind of the joke in the Park Service that Hartwig was working on this book on Antietam <laughs> that, that was never going to get finished. But, uh, you know, I was I was. I was raising kids and working a job and doing anything like that. And I just was slow and steady. I kept plugging away at it and I finally finished it, but it did, it was a tremendous, tremendous amount of work. Um, this volume has been a tremendous amount of work. Um, I am going to miss it when I'm done because uh, I've come to know the people who, uh, who fought the battle and suffered as a result of the battle because not everybody who suffered in Antietam was in the battle. There were people at home who uh, lost family members in it and they suffered plenty. Um, I've just, you know, some of them, I probably wouldn't like them if I met them, but there's something about many of these people. There's something that's just simple and uh, they, they, they didn't see their world as simple. They saw their world as very complex and uh, troubled, but yeah. um I'll miss them. I, I'll miss uh, being around them and hearing them talk and reading their letters and getting to know who they are. And uh, so what are a couple of things that I could say that um, people don't know about it? Maybe people do know it. I mean, people may know more than I know. I don't know. Um, but there's quite a few things that I've encountered in the, in the course of this that um, you know, uh, we have a tendency in the Civil War field, um, particularly students of the Civil War and enthusiasts of the Civil War, we have our favorites. We have, uh, I remember when I was at Gettysburg, Longstreet, there was the anti-Longstreet crowd and there was the pro-Longstreet crowd. And uh, I never I never liked that. I never, these were real people. They were human beings, they were complex. They had successes, they had failures and um, take them, as they really are and be critical. I mean, be critical, but be fair in your criticism. As I used to train uh, our interpreters when they would come on, we would go out on the battlefield and I'd be talking to them about, you know, doing interpretive programs on the Gettysburg battlefield. I would remind them, I'd say, you, you are the voice of the people who live this event. This is not your platform to perform or to make a name for yourself. This, this is your job is to teach American history as honestly as you can. And that means to teach it honestly, you need to really know it. You have to read, you have to research and you never stop doing it. You're always, you're always trying to learn. And it doesn't mean you can't criticize decisions that people made. These people, uh, there's a lot of times I think people make a mistake because someone's a veteran um, and they were exposed to terrible things, we give them some sort of deference that uh, they can't be criticized because I, I, don't, I don't agree with that, uh, particularly with professional soldiers. I mean, this was their profession, this was their job. And as a historian, it is your job to look at them in a critical way, but you need to be fair in your criticism. So as I was working on this book, just to relate one story, um, I came across a story of John Caldwell, who uh, was a division commander in the second Corps at Gettysburg and performed really, really well in that battle. He didn't perform well in Antietam. In fact, um, uh, Edward Cross, one of his regimental commanders who commanded the fifth New Hampshire brought charges against Caldwell for cowardice. And uh, yeah. the way Caldwell got off on the charges, he was not, uh, 
his commission was not taken from when he wasn't cashiered from the army, was the testimony of a surgeon. Because a surgeon had seen Caldwell behind the lines and he didn't feel probably that Caldwell was doing what a brigade commander was supposed to be doing. But he admitted that he didn't understand what a brigade commander was supposed to do in the first place. He was a surgeon. And on that, they uh, exonerated Caldwell. So, okay, how do we reconcile that? How does Caldwell had to be the same guy the whole time? I said, no, he, no, he didn't. He didn't have to be the same person the entire time. Caldwell could falter at one moment in his military career. He's a human being and he can recover himself and perform really, really well like he did in the Battle of Gettysburg. I think that makes these people much more interesting than these one-dimensional characters that we kind of want. They're like, they're like collecting baseball cards, you know? Sure. Uh, but anyway, um, a couple of things about the campaign. Uh, there's a lot on it that um, I could talk about. One that I found very interesting is that um, many of the engagements took place at much greater ranges than I would have ever imagined, three and 400 yards. And what you find in those engagements is that frequently uh, soldiers, a lot of soldiers are hit, but the bullet doesn't break their skin because the range is so great. And I think yeah. sometimes soldiers are excited. They're some dumping some of their powder out on the ground. They're not getting the full powder charge into the weapon. So you know, they don't have the full propellant. So consequently, uh, the, 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 wep the, the projectiles weren't as lethal. So I did find that pretty interesting that, um, that uh, these engagements oftentimes took, took place at much greater ranges than uh, people imagined. Uh, a second thing, that I, I alluded to it earlier, that I um, was, I knew that the Confederate Army took pretty heavy losses in the Battle of Antietam, but uh, I had not really realized how badly hurt that army was in this battle. Uh, they had they had at least nine brigades that I can think of off the top of my head that had lost all organization by the end of the day. They they were completely disorganized. They had no organization. They were not they were not even close to combat effective. Alfred Colquitt's brigade is one of them. I mean, they had probably had less than a hundred men left in the brigade. Now that doesn't mean everybody else was killed or wounded or captured. What it meant that the survivors who hadn't been killed, wounded or captured were scattered all over the place. And it took them a couple of days to recollect all the survivors. And then once you recollect them, you have to reorganize them because you've lost, uh, some regiments lost all their officers. They didn't have any officers left. And you know, we often imagine, oh, well, they, they lost all our officers, so all they did was they just promoted these guys. Well, it doesn't work that way. Uh, some of the people who are enlisted men, they don't want to be officers. They're not capable of being officers. They don't have any leadership ability. They shirk responsibility. So when you try to reorganize, it's a big deal. So the I found that the, the Army of Northern Virginia was really badly damaged in the battle. And I also have found that their problem with straggling was epic, simply epic. Uh, and one of the great, um, I mean, you know, I'm not completed on my opinion on this, but it appears to me that um, one of the mis mistakes that McClellan made is, yes, he definitely had supply issues in, uh, in September and October. He, he, there's no question about it. But Lee's supply issues were much greater than McClellan's. And McClellan had a massive intelligence failure because there was, there was a, an abundance of intelligence about the condition of Lee's army. He'd taken prisoners, he had wounded men, and there were the dead on the battlefield. You could see the condition of their equipment and their uniforms, and you could, talk, you could interrogate prisoners, and you could talk to civilians who were in the area, and all would have given you the same picture. This was an army that was, uh, had no logistical trail at, train at all. They were... They were just trying to forge from the landscape to get anything to eat for their guys. And it was an army that had been really badly damaged. So in that case, you put maximum pressure on that army. You don't let them recover. And uh, what McClellan did is he, he did let them recover. And then Lee built a very formidable army that he brought onto the battlefield at Fredericksburg. It's interesting. Um, uh, Lee comes north twice. And of course, 
your first work uh, that we've been talking about is that first effort north in, into Maryland, and he comes back um, uh, less than a year later. Uh, in your view, uh, why did Gettysburg happen, and could it have been avoided, and if so, how? Okay, why does Gettysburg happen? So if Karen can bring up the, uh, the, the PowerPoint program, and if, if she can, and we can bring it to the first slide, uh, it'll be easier if we use that to illustrate. Um, blue circle to the south of it, that is the Army of the Potomac, and that is Frederick, Maryland. Uh, for some of you who may not be from this area, that is 30 miles away. So from the blue circle to the green circle is 30 miles. Where Karen's uh, laser pointer is running up from along the uh, uh, from the blue circle to the green circle, she is following the line of a mountain range called South Mountain. Not super tall, about 2,000 feet uh, is the highest elevation in South Mountain, but for an army, that's a pretty considerable barrier. When we look to the west of Gettysburg or to the left of the green circle, you see Hill, that is AP Hill. He commands the Confederate Third Corps. Behind him is Longstreet. He commands the Confederate First Corps. And Longstreet is at Chambersburg. Hill is at Fayetteville. North of them, we see Johnson. He commands an infantry division of General Richard Ewell's Second Corps. You keep going north, and you're going to see Rhodes. He's at Carlisle. And if you keep going to the southeast, that's Jubal Early, and he is at York. From York, to Chambersburg is a little over 50 miles. So if you were Robert E. Lee on June 28th, your army was pretty widely divided. Why are you widely divided? You're widely divided because at this point in the campaign, you are going after two secondary objectives and they are number one, gathering supplies in Pennsylvania. They're gathering, gathering a immense quantity of supplies in Pennsylvania. And number two, the roads, you can see Yule's up there with roads, they are operating against Harrisburg. They're going to try to capture the state capital and capture the railroad bridge over the Susquehanna. It was a very complicated operation. But if Lee could capture Harrisburg, it was going to be a, a, a really big political uh, blow to the Lincoln administration and win for the Confederates. But on June 28th, Lee learns that the fellow you see in the picture in the lower right, George Gordon Meade, has been placed in command of the Army of the Potomac and that the Army of the Potomac is at Frederick, Maryland. Now, why is that pretty significant? Those both are significant because Lee thought the Union Army was still below the Potomac River, so about 20 miles south of Frederick. So the Union Army is closer than Lee thought they were, but they have a new commander. Joe Hooker's gone. So let's go to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So the, Lee is going to order a concentration of his army at a this is a this is a smaller scale of that same map. And by the way, the map that you're looking at is the Jedediah Hotchkiss map that was drawn for Stonewall Jackson, I think in February of 1863. Uh, it still remains one of the most detailed maps of the Gettysburg, the theater of operations in the Gettysburg campaign. And it's in the atlas, uh, the official atlas of the, uh, of the War of the Rebellion. So Lee orders a concentration of his entire army. After he gets this intelligence on June 28th, he orders his whole army to concentrate. And they're going to concentrate where you see the big red circle that says Heath. That is a small town, still a small town, about eight miles west of Gettysburg called Cashtown. It is at the base of South Mountain. That is where Lee orders his entire army to concentrate. So why does Lee order his army to concentrate at Cashtown? What's the point of that? Well, Lee tells us one thing. He tells us this campaign is not about gathering supplies. If that was the campaign plan, he would have blocked the mountain passes, gathered his supplies and withdrawn down to Cumberland Valley. There wouldn't have been a battle. He tells us that the campaign is not about capturing Harrisburg. That's not the primary objective. If that was the objective, he would have uh, put a holding force in front of the Federals, captured Harrisburg, and then withdrawn down to Cumberland Valley. His movement east of the mountain range to Cashtown tells us that his objective is the Army of the Potomac. That is what Lee is seeking. 
only by defeating the Army of the Potomac is Lee going to achieve the political objectives and the military objectives upon which he embarked upon this campaign. So in the last days of June, Lee's army is on the move to effect this concentration. By June 30th, the Confederates had these forces near Gettysburg that you see on the map. You see General Heath, and you see north of Gettysburg, Robert Rhodes and Jubal Early's divisions. Now remember Early was in York and Rhodes was in Carlisle. So they are on June 30th, marching from those points to where you see them on the map. And they're gonna bivouac there on the night of June 30th. General Heath on June 30th is going to order an infantry brigade under General James Pettigrew to march to Gettysburg and search the town for supplies, particularly a supply of shoes that Heath claims he's heard that is in the town. And he wants those shoes because these soldiers in both armies wore out their shoes really, really quickly on these macadamized roads in Pennsylvania. Now, Pettigrew was given explicit orders. He was not to bring on an engagement with any troops that he might encounter, but he was told the only troops he's likely to encounter are going to be militia. Nevertheless, no fight. On the same day that Pettigrew starts to march to Gettysburg on his supply expedition, down at the bottom of the map, General John Buford, who commands a cavalry division, is marching up to Gettysburg to occupy the town and patrol all the roads emanating out from the town. His objective is to gather intelligence about the Army of Northern Virginia, where their main strength is located, what their intentions might be. Pettigrew, as he's marching towards Gettysburg, was warned a couple of times about the approach of Union cavalry to Gettysburg, so he was on the alert. He halted his brigade a couple of miles from the town and then went forward with the skirmish line to where the Lutheran Seminary is located. And when he got to that point, he could look south east of Gettysburg down to the Emmitsburg Road. That's the road that Buford's cavalry is going to march up. And he could see cavalry coming up the road. So that confirmed for him that federal cavalry was approaching Gettysburg. He didn't know who they were. He didn't know how strong they were. And some of his staff also heard drums in Gettysburg, which they thought might indicate in infantry. Pettigrew turned around, he abided, obeyed his orders. He marched back to General Heath and he reported to General Heath that he had observed the federal cavalry because they had shadowed his movements as he marched back out the Chambersburg Pike to Cashtown. And he was convinced that the cavalry was from the Army of the Potomac. They looked like veteran troops in the way they maneuvered and how aggressive they were. And that was his opinion. Well, Heath didn't believe him because the latest intelligence Heath has is that the Federal Army is still well down in Maryland. He thinks that um, Pettigrew might be a little jumpy, he's exaggerating. He hasn't been with the Army since the Seven Days Battles, not with the Army of Northern Virginia. But anyway, A.P. Hill, the Corps commander, arrives and Pettigrew is going to brief A.P. Hill with Heath. And Hill is going to tell Pettigrew the same thing. I, he said, I just came from a, a, a meeting with General Lee. Latest intelligence places the Yankees still over 20 miles south of Gettysburg. So uh, there's no major force up here. You may have seen a force of observation, might just be militia. But whatever the case, Hill does decide that there is something in Gettysburg and he needs to find out what it is. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, the number of roads in the Gettysburg that were macadamized was the Chambersburg Pike, the York Pike, they're both macadamized, and the Baltimore Turnpike. So there were three major roads coming to Gettysburg that are all macadamized. All the others were uh, county roads, which meant they were dirt, packed dirt. And if you had any amount of rain, uh, they were become very muddy. With the 11th Corps, you see on the map, the arrow shows their, their movement. They get under the Tawny Town Road and the Tawny Town Road was terribly muddy that they had to march through. So that was not a fun experience for them. So those are the roads that are macadamized. Chambersburg Pike, York Pike, Baltimore Pike. And those are the most important roads to the armies because they're all all weather roads. Macadamized road is crushed stone, packed dirt on top of it. So if it rains and pours, that road is still going to be uh, capable of handling heavy army traffic. So the map now shows us the situation um, 
on the night of June 30th, we now see Heath and he's been joined by Pender's division and we see Rhodes and Early up north of town. Buford is at Gettysburg, but we now see five miles south of Gettysburg, the first Corps, 12 miles south of Gettysburg, the 11th Corps, about 15 miles southeast of Gettysburg, the 12th Corps. So we had the ingredients for a battle and how the battle is going to actually begin is General Hill is going to make a decision uh, that he is going to conduct a reconnaissance in force on July the 1st. They're not going to look for shoes on July the 1st. They are going to find out what the Yankees have in Gettysburg. So he orders Heath to march to Gettysburg on the Chambersburg Pike. And supposedly Heath's orders are, if he encounters cavalry, drive them back, occupy Gettysburg. If he encounters infantry, he was to halt and report back for orders. We don't know that that is the case. His orders were almost certainly verbal. So the, there's some evidence to that effect. Pender's gonna follow him. That's 14,000 men are gonna march on Gettysburg from the west. Hill sends a rider to the north to, to Ewell and he advises Ewell of his movement and suggests to Ewell that he divert the march of Rhodes and Early. They're marching to Cashtown, but he, he suggests they divert their march from the north into Gettysburg. That way, if by chance Hill ran into a problem west of Gettysburg, Rhodes and Early would come in behind the enemy and that would unhinge the enemy line. I actually think Hill's plan for July the 1st was a very safe one and, and was a good one. Um, and uh, where it comes apart and why we end up with a battle at Gettysburg has to do with uh, Buford and Reynolds and Henry Heath. When Heath marched on Gettysburg on the morning of July the 1st, uh, Buford, who had no orders to defend Gettysburg, he wasn't told to defend Gettysburg. He realized the importance of this crossroads based upon the position of the Union Army, and he decided to resist the Confederate advance as long as he could to allow Reynolds to reach the field, who was the commander of the First Corps, and also the commander of the left wing of the army, which was the 1st, 3rd, and 11th Corps. And he was going to let Reynolds make a final decision. When Heath uh, moves against Buford, by his own report, he says that he encountered what he thought was infantry, artillery, and cavalry in the Gettysburg area. And he makes a fateful decision. His decision is, I can handle this. But when he makes the fateful decision, he also doesn't follow through by going in with everything he has. He takes half of his division and he advances against Buford. And Reynolds reaches the field. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about him in a little bit. But he reaches the field and makes a decision to um, engage the Confederates at Gettysburg. And his the first troops of the First Corps that reach the field really give Heath a bloody nose and knock him back. And that is going to start the, 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 uh, the uh, snowball of events that is going to lead to the full scale battle of Gettysburg. So it's, it's all these different decisions that people are making and sometimes decisions of poor judgment that, that bring, this to, uh, bring this to a clash on July the 1st at Gettysburg. Right. Um, your program uh, is uh, a historian's reflections on the first day at Gettysburg. Um, what intrigues you the most about uh, the first day of fighting? Um, there's, yeah, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, different things in that we could talk about. I mean, one thing that intrigues me is, um, Buford and Reynolds, uh, really are crucial on this day. Buford's de decision and the way he conducted his defense in depth, dismounting his troopers, harassing the Confederates. He lost very few men. Uh, Buford on July the 1st, I think, lost 130 men in his entire division. So he loses very few men in this skirmishing. But what he accomplished is he, he slowed Heath down. He made Heath cautious and he made Heath move slowly, which gave Reynolds time to come on the field and make a decision. And I think sometimes people don't appreciate the, um, how difficult the decision was that Reynolds had. Reynolds had the authority based on his orders, if you read through his orders, to engage the Confederates at Gettysburg. He did have that authority to do that. He had the authority to 
uh, decide to make a defensive position south of Gettysburg on the place that the Army of the Potomac ultimately fights the second and third day of the battle. He also had authority to pull everyone back to near the Maryland-Pennsylvania line and defend the approaches to Emmitsburg. Now, some of the, the viewers here might be familiar with the Pipe Creek Circular that General Meade developed on the morning of July the 1st. Uh, which was a plan for the entire Union Army to pull back out of Pennsylvania, those units that had advanced into Pennsylvania. They would pull back into Northern Maryland behind Pipe Creek, which was a very good defensive position, and Meade hoped to fight a defensive battle against Lee there. Reynolds never received the Pipe Creek circular. So he's operating on all the orders that you can go through the official records of the War of the Rebellion. You can read them all. And based on the intelligence that Reynolds had, Hill's Corps was 30,000 men. We know it was 20,000, but it's important to know what did Reynolds think? What did Army Intelligence tell him? 30,000 men. He also knew that um, Ewell was somewhere to the north of Gettysburg. He didn't know where he was or how close he was. So he had three options. The riskiest was to do what he did, which was to defend the approaches west and north of the town. What's the advantage is that he defends the road network and he screens the ground you want to fight the main battle on south of the town of Gettysburg. His second option would have been to occupy that key to vents of terrain, let Buford delay the enemy for a little while and fight your battle on that ground. Problem with that decision, if you get knocked off it, you lost the key terrain and you lose the Gettysburg position. His third option was to fall back towards the Maryland line. That was the safest move that he could have made. He makes the boldest, riskiest move. So that's one thing of the first day that I think is a, is a really significant decision. I think there was a question on there, did Reynolds like to get up close? <clears throat> I don't think he liked to get up uh, closer than, than many other generals did. I think he did at Gettysburg because he knew he was making a tremendous risk with the decision that he made and he had to occupy certain key positions like Herp's Woods in order to, to defend that position. So he knew he'd made a big, uh, bold decision, and he put himself on the line, and he probably shouldn't have been <clears throat> that close as he was because <clears throat> it cost him his life. Um, so the second thing I'd say about the first day um, that is really significant is it, is it is just incredibly bloody fighting. So the Union Regiment, for the entire Army of the Potomac that suffers the highest casualties in the Battle of Gettysburg is the 24th Michigan. They fight in Herps Woods in the first day's field. The Confederate Regiment that suffers the highest casualties of any regiment in the Army of Northern Virginia, the 26th North Carolina, fights in Herps Woods against the 24th Michigan. So he, Every regiment in the first corps lost 50% of their men. Every regiment in an Army Corps, it is, it's unbelievable. I mean, so the thing that Reynolds does here is, um, and I think this underscores just how grim decisions generals had to make sometimes. He traded men for time. I mean, that's ultimately what he was doing. He was trading men for time. And uh, he took an enormous gamble in doing it. And he ultimately succeeded because by the end of the day, the Union Army occupied the position and was going to be able to fight the battle on the ground that they wanted to fight on, or that I think Reynolds would have wanted them to fight on, which was the best defensive terrain in Gettysburg. Is there any outcome of any of the Confederate successes on the first day that might have been decisive and would have compelled me to cede the field to Lee? Is yeah, yes. I think if uh, Lee, if Lee had um, given orders to Ewell and A.P. Hill and reinforced A.P. Hill with um, Anderson's division, because Anderson's division comes up uh, very late in the action and Lee held Anderson in reserve uh, about five miles west of Gettysburg. And I completely understand why Lee did that. I'm not criticizing Lee's decision to hold Anderson in reserve. He held him in reserve because Lee had no cavalry with him. He had no idea where the rest of the Union Army was. He only knew that he had faced Buford's division and the 1st and 11th Corps. But had Lee sent all of Hill's Corps that was on the field and all of Ewell's Corps on the field, I really don't see how the Federals could have held on to Cemetery Hill. And 
if they'd lost Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill, then Meade is going to um, enact the Pipe Creek Circuiter. But there would have been some confusion because Meade had already scrapped the Pipe Creek Circuiter. So he would have had to send couriers to all of his corps commanders and make sure they all receive these messages and that they all execute it. That's a, that's a tall order. It would have been difficult to do. However, one of the strengths of Meade in uh, the whole Gettysburg campaign and particularly in the battle is that Meade often had alternative plans and uh, which many civil war generals did not have. If everything went wrong, they had to completely come up with a plan. Meade had alternative plans and that might have helped him somewhat, but I think that uh, Lee taking Gettysburg and the key terrain at Gettysburg on July the 1st would have given would have given Lee a big advantage in the campaign. Okay. Um, Dave Collins has asked, um, he said, the heights beyond the town, most historians identify that high ground as Cemetery Hill. And he says he's seen it written in Gettysburg Magazine that some identify the high ground as Oak Hill Low. What is it? Your thoughts? Um, well, it depends on which direction you're looking from. If you are um, on Cemetery Hill and you're looking north, the high ground is Oak Hill. That's the highest piece of ground that you see. Uh, it's where the, the peace light is today. And even today, if you go up there, even though there's a lot of trees in the cemetery, uh, you can see that. Um, if you're looking at Gettysburg from the west or the north, the high ground is pretty clear. It's Cemetery Hill, it's Culp's Hill, it's little round top, big round top. And as you move around to the southwest of Gettysburg, it's Cemetery Ridge, which becomes visible then. Um, <clears throat> Joe Fafaras asked, um, or I'm sorry, John Bonasingas asked, um, uh, he'd like uh, your analysis of Rhodes' performance uh, fighting his division at Oak Hill. Yeah, initially it was awful. And, uh, but Rhodes recovered himself and um, fought very smart in his subsequent attack. So his initial attack, which was uh, two brigades supported by a third brigade, it was O'Neill's brigade and Iverson's brigade were to lead the attack against what Rhodes thought was the right flank of the enemy forces opposing him, which was the first corps. And what he thought was their right flank was in a uh, woodlot, which is actually the Wills McPherson Woods, uh, located just north of the seminary. So that was his plan, and he was going to support that with Daniel's brigade. It was very poorly coordinated. It was very poorly executed. And the attack suffered unbelievable losses. Our, uh, Iverson's brigade lost 1,000 killed, wounded, and captured. Uh, and the brigade was essentially destroyed for the rest of the campaign. O'Neill's brigade took pretty substantial losses as well, and they're driven back. And then Daniel's brigade kind of moved on south and becomes engaged around the, the uh, McPherson farm with uh, Colonel Roy Stone's Bucktail Brigade. And um, so Rhodes reorganized his division after that initial repulse. And the way he seems to have conducted his attacks was through uh, massive use of skirmishers, not big formed lines of battle trying to move forward, just harassing the enemy with the skirmishers, which proved to be extremely effective and inflicted pretty heavy losses on the Federals and enabled him then to use Ramser's brigade to maneuver against the Federals and drive them from their position on Oak Ridge. So again, that, I think that's what makes these people interesting. Again, is they're not one-dimensional human being. They're not one-dimensional uh, cartoon characters. They're real people. Rhodes makes, definitely makes mistakes in the opening part of his attack, but he recovers himself and he shows his experience as a soldier. Great. <clears throat> Joe Fafara has um, asked, he, um, uh, he has a, a thing about uh, the Confederate brigadiers and, and how they performed on July 1st. And uh, he believes that a number of them failed, particularly James Lane. Um, uh, could you give a, a summary of your, your uh, view of the performance of the Confederate Brigadiers on the first day? Um, some performed 
poorly. Some performed pretty well. I don't think Lane performed poorly at all based on the circumstances. He, uh, you know, you have to put yourself in his shoes. Um, Buford, Buford used his cavalry against Lane extremely effectively. What he did is he had dismounted troopers and he also mounted a couple of his regiments and maneuvered against Lane. Lane has no idea at all what forces are out there. He has nothing protecting his flank. He has no cavalry to scout for him. Uh, you'd be cautious too if you were in Lane's shoes. So I, I don't really criticize him uh, in not driving forward. I think uh, the bigger error was um, AP Hill's tactics were extremely unimaginative which was um, he attacked the Federals with Pender's division exactly where the Federals wanted him to attack them. So had he, had he moved Pender's division to the right of Heath and just held Heath, Heath in position, he would have outflanked the Federal line on Seminary Ridge and they would have had to run for their lives. He wouldn't have lost 1,100 men in Pender's division. And um, he, uh, he, he might've taken Cemetery Hill with that maneuver. So there's no, there's no effort at maneuver. Um, now, on the other hand, Jubal Early, uh, love him or hate him, um, he is the most effective division commander in the Army of Northern Virginia on July the 1st. He maneuvered his division brilliantly. He unhinged the 11th Corps line. Uh, it was a hard fight. He lost a fair number of casualties, but nothing remotely close to what uh, the units fighting the first corps did. He, uh, I think, inflicted like six to one or five to one, something like that, casualties on the Federals. So Jubal Early wins a, a really, really significant victory. And uh, now I'm talking division commanders. I know I'm not talking brigade commanders. Um, on the brigade front, um, one of the most conspicuous leaders, I think, for the Confederates has to be um, James Perrin, commanding Perrin's South Carolina Brigade. Uh, he showed tremendous courage and also his his brigade showed a remarkable ability to maneuver under fire which was extremely difficult to do on the lower end of the totem pole you'd have to put alfred iverson uh he did not perform very well on july the first neither did edward o'neill and it's no surprise that those two men aren't going to be with you. on the lower end of the totem pole you'd have to put alfred iverson uh, uh, he did not perform very well on July the 1st, neither did Edward O'Neill. And it's no surprise that those two men aren't going to be with the Army of Northern Virginia after Gettysburg. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Frank DeFore from uh, South Carolina uh, wants your uh, thoughts uh, that if Lee had disengaged on the first day, in other words, if, if he had not pursued and stayed in position and perhaps pulled back up the Cashtown Road uh, into a defensive position, uh, maybe using the, uh, the mountains uh, to, uh, to support him. Might he have defeated Meade or might Meade have uh, come after him there or would Meade have left him alone? I don't know that Meade would have gone after him there because, um, and I also don't think Lee ever would have contemplated that. I mean, he, Lee considered all sorts of options and alternatives himself, but, and he may have considered that alternative. I'm not saying he didn't, but I think the reason uh, it would be uncharacteristic of Lee to ever surrender the initiative, and that would have been surrendering the initiative to Meade, just as I think uh, Meade actually made a mistake on July the 1st with the Pipe Creek Circular because he surrendered the initiative to Lee with that circular, and I don't like your chances when you surrender the initiative to Lee. Reynolds and Buford seized the initiative and forced Lee's army to react to what they were doing. Now, Lee's victory on the first day gives him back the initiative. Lee doesn't want to give that up. So he's, he's going he's gonna, to um, seize the initiative. Now, where Lee... I think from my armchair sitting here <laughs> that, I could, that I could criticize Lee... After the second day, you, the federal position's too strong. It's not worth it. It's not worth another day of fighting there. I think Longstreet, Longstreet had destroyed his credibility with Lee at this point in the battle, but I think Longstreet was right. It was time to move, to move the army. He could have moved the army back into Maryland near Hagerstown, entrenched his position, kept his army north of the Potomac River, 
placed the pressure upon Meade to try to come to him, evacuated his wounded, resupplied his army, and possibly renewed his campaign. I think that puts Lee in a better position. He doesn't suffer the, the, uh, the devastating casualties that he does. But again, uh, you know, it takes the emotion out of it when we look at it that way. And I think that Lee, uh, he saw the federal army in front of him and he had so much confidence he could whip them that um, he just wasn't going to be deterred. He was going to win the battle. And um, that overconfidence has uh, been the undoing of many generals in human history. Thank you. <clears throat> Gary Brand um, made an observation. He said, when we visit the battlefield today, uh, for the first day, for example, we see the McPherson barn is the only structure really we see. How do all the other structures such as McPherson house and outbuildings and Forney farmhouse and other structures come into play during the battle? Um, at the McPherson farm, those structures came into play as a place for the wounded to gather. And there, there were some Union soldiers of Stone's Brigade who used the barn as a defensive position, uh, although the Confederates ran in and cleaned them out pretty quickly. But I mean, the problem was they were fighting in there and there were uh, hundreds of wounded <clears throat> inside the barn. Um, the Herps farm was the same situation. They had uh, a number of wounded in there. And that is the only reason that Herps house survived because Pettigrew's brigade burned the Harmon farm and they, they burned Herb's barn and were about to burn his house. And the reason they were burning this is not just because they wanted to just destroy stuff. They were burning it because in case they got driven back, the Federals had used the Harmon farm as a place for sharpshooters. And they didn't want the Federals to have those, those, uh, those structures for sharpshooting. So they were going to burn them. And uh, they were able to talk the Confederate this Confederate lieutenant out of burning Herp's house because of the wounded that were in there. The Forney farm was just an obstacle in the way of uh, Iverson's brigade. Kind of a sad story. The Park Service tore it down before the 75th anniversary because it was very run down and they thought it was an eyesore. <laughs> that was that was before <laughs> the days that, that we made sure we tried to preserve those things. So, um, and the uh, McLean farm is another one that... Uh, about 300 men from O'Neill's brigade were captured around the house and the barn because they took cover in them. So some of these farm buildings were used as cover. The Hagee Farm, which doesn't exist, that was on the uh, Mummersburg Road. Carl Schurz climbed up to the roof of that for an observation point. So a lot of these had different uses in the course of the battle. Are you, Pat Scott uh, wanted to know what happened to the 2nd and 42nd Mississippi in the 55th North Carolina in the railroad bed? They were all part of Joseph Davis's brigade and uh, Davis's brigade outflanked uh, Lysander Cutler's brigade of the first Corps, inflicted really heavy losses on them and drove them back towards Gettysburg and were pursuing those retreating federal soldiers. They, they themselves, the Confederate regiments had all taken pretty substantial losses in the firefight with Cutler's brigade. But as they're advancing, uh, they, uh, Davis saw a federal force approaching his flank. And that was the 6th Wisconsin. And on the other side of McPherson's Ridge, the 6th couldn't see these other federal troops, the 95th New York and the 14th Brooklyn. There was about 900 men coming at his flank. So Davis issued an order for the brigade to withdraw, which in the confusion of the moment uh, did not reach many of the men. So the uh, the Confederates, seeing this federal force on their flank, got into the railroad cut for cover to uh, engage the federal force that they saw along the Chambersburg Pike. So it's a hodgepodge. They're all mixed together. They, they don't have any really command and control or coordination. Uh, some parts of the railroad cut are so deep that the men who were in that part of the cut couldn't even fight. Nevertheless, they inflicted pretty heavy losses on the 6th Wisconsin uh, which charged their position, followed by the two New York regiments. And because they're in the cut and the Federals were able to get up, uh, particularly the 6th Wisconsin on their flank, they outflanked the position and um, about 250 men are, are forced to surrender. The rest of them escaped out the other end of the cut. However, the brigade was so badly damaged, they'd lost every field officer 
in three regiments except for one. And they were so badly damaged, they did not bring him into the action for the rest of the battle and did bring them into the action on July the 3rd. They were part of Pickett's charge with pretty catastrophic consequences for the brigade. Okay. Uh, Tom Beal would like to know, uh, uh, did anybody in the 11th Corps receive any intelligence that Early was coming down the Harrisburg Road? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I have to believe that they did because uh, Devin's brigade, Thomas Devin's brigade of Buford's division was out there and they skirmished both with Rhodes and with Early. They knew that they were coming and that was their job. I'm sure they reported that back to Howard and uh, whether Howard shared that information with Schurz, we don't know. Schurz doesn't say that he did. Um, it may also have influenced why Howard um, allowed Barlow to move into the position that he did because they may have felt that that was a, a good blocking position against the Confederates coming down the old Harrisburg road. Um, but if they did, the um, Howard did not manage that very well. Uh, I'm more critical in that circumstance of Howard than I am of Carl Schurz. Schurz, in my estimation, actually did a very competent job commanding the 11th Corps in a really impossible situation. Um, because Howard was giving orders to division commanders that were supposed to be under Scherz's orders, and Scherz didn't know some of the things that Howard was doing. And uh, they didn't have a very good relationship at this point because uh, Howard had been very critical of the German troops in the Corps after the Battle of Chancellorsville, very unfairly, I might add, um, and they didn't appreciate that. So I think there was some... Um, some uh, animosity there that may have affected command and control. On the screen says, Marcus Colonius, um, uh, there are a lot of criticisms lavished on the 11th Corps, both prior to the battle and after Gettysburg. Uh, what's your opinion of the 11th Corps' performance on day one? Well, the Corps, um, they had some really good units in the 11th Corps, but they also did have some units that had morale problems. And... Uh, you know, certain, certain units like the, the, the first division, they did not like Barlow very much. Uh, they didn't have a lot of confidence in him. He didn't like them. Uh, he particularly didn't like the Germans in, the, in, in Barlow, in that division. Um, but in defense of the Corps, I would say they were placed in an indefensible position. They had about 5,300 men to command a front that was over a mile long. That's impossible. They just couldn't do it. And then Barlow went off on his own hook. He was completely unsupported, and it forced Schurz to try to um, come to his support with Krasnowski's brigade. And what it ended up allowing the Confederates to do is to defeat the 11th Corps in detail. And if Schurz had been able to execute the defense I think he wanted to, he still would have been defeated, but I don't think he would have suffered the losses that he did, particularly in prisoners, and he would have been able to withdraw in better order back to Cemetery Hill. So my opinion is, um, you know, the 11th Corps, they had, uh, they were as, they were a good unit overall. They had some morale issues as a result of Chancellorsville and a lack of confidence in their corps commander in Howard and a lack of confidence in one of their division commanders in Barlow. So uh, that's going to affect the Corps' performance. Okay. <clears throat> Pat Schuber wanted to know what, uh, your opinion was on Yule's failure to follow up by attacking uh, the Union position as Lee had requested? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that Yule, uh, our thinking about Yule is greatly shaped by Douglas Southall Freeman and Clifford Doughty, who um, always took Lee's side in everything and um, did not want to criticize Lee, so they found other people that, that they could heap the criticism on. And uh, so I think uh, um, Freeman had a, one of his chapters in Lee's Lieutenants was Yule can't reach a decision. Well, I would argue Yule did reach a decision. So on July the 1st, his uh, Corps had won a Stonewall Jackson-esque victory. They swept the 11th Corps from the field. They outflanked the 1st Corps. They occupied the town. Uh, yes, Rhodes Division had taken really heavy losses, 2,000 men. They're pretty much not fit for any more combat. But Yule, Early's division was in pretty good shape. Yule's, 
Yule's going to get an order from Lee to take Cemetery Hill if practicable, but don't bring on a general engagement. Now put yourself in Yule's shoes. What does that mean? That's a pretty maddening order to get. What? Don't bring on a general. What do you mean? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to guess here. What I think Lee meant by that is if you can take that hill and you are not going to commit me to a battle here tomorrow, go ahead and do it. But if you think trying to take that hill is going to lead to an even wider battle, I'm not prepared to do that. So I'm relying on your judgment here. But the other critical piece of this that gets lost is Lee, the army commander, offers Yule no help. He's got another army corps on the field. He's got half or two thirds of AP Hill's corps. In fact, he's going to get the rest of the corps when Anderson's division arrived. He offers him no help. Ewell ends up negotiating with A.P. Hill to get A.P. Hill's support. A.P. Hill tells him, no, he said, my men are fought out. They, they can't, uh, they're not capable of any more combat today. Ewell also gets a report of um, a large Union force that was off to his flank to the east. That was actually the 12th Corps, which marched almost up to the York Pike before it turned around. He couldn't ignore that. He has no cavalry to check that out. He doesn't know where the rest of the Union Army is. So Ewell ultimately made a decision in that um, it wasn't practicable to try to take Cemetery Hill because he didn't feel he had the manpower. He was attacking the hill at the most difficult point of attack. He had no support. Lee was offering no support. And ultimately, I think the responsibility that the Confederates don't take Cemetery Hill isn't Ewell's, it's Lee's. Uh, Tom Beal wanted to know, um, uh, what did you think about the uh, relief of Abner Doubleday? Uh, it was definitely unjust. Um, Meade didn't like Doubleday. They went back a long ways. They'd both been in the first corps together. Um, Meade wasn't alone in that. I, Doubleday seemed to have been uh, something of a grating personality. Other people didn't like him. Now, some of it may have to do with the fact that Doubleday was a Republican and um, you know, amongst professional army officers, most of them were Democrats, they were conservatives, and uh, Meade was definitely a conservative. And, um, but I think it was, it was more than that because even people who were with Doubleday at Fort Sumter didn't care for him. He, I think it was just his personality, uh, but he performed really, really well on July the 1st. I think his relief was completely unjustified. I don't think that um, Meade understood what Doubleday did I don't know that he ever completely understood what Doubleday did. And um, Howard threw Doubleday under the bus because if you read, if you read the, uh, the correspondence that goes back and forth between Howard and Meade, Howard tells Meade that Doubleday's core gave way, which that, yeah. that was That's the, the pot calling a kettle black. That was the document <laughs> that Meade used to relieve uh, Doubleday of command. So, um, sure. I think Howard, you know, he's trying to defend his reputation. He'd had this, uh, he didn't want another disaster on his resume. So he, uh, he was casting about for any way that he could uh, help himself. Well, Scott, I sure appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, uh, we've spent an hour and we've touched on an awful lot of stuff and, and it, it's a blatant advertisement. I'm sorry, but we, look what we did in one hour, and we're going to have Scott talking about this for 17 hours. I got 10 seats left on that bus if anybody's looking. Uh, it's April uh, 30th through May 2nd, and we have a backup if, um, if and we have to do that. Uh, so uh, we think that um, uh, this is going to be a great program and uh, with a great historian. Scott, can't thank you enough. It's always a pleasure to work with you, and um, I look forward to uh, – to seeing you sooner rather than later. Stay safe. Well, I thank everybody who came on this call tonight. It's fantastic to have you all out there. I wish I could see all your faces and, uh, you know, uh, really, really enjoyed doing this. So thanks well, for Thank us. you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much. And uh, you all have a good evening next week. Gordon Ray on the 10th uh, to talk about the Overland campaign. Y'all take care. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>